Two individuals, both highly respected, both very articulate, and both globally recognized participants in an ongoing dialogue uh, between these two faith groups, Jay Smith and Shabir Ali. It is a high privilege for us to have this time to talk together, and in particular, to talk about peace. Now today we're here as the audience. When we go home, we will no longer be the audience. We will be the ones in conversation with Muslim neighbors and classmates and co-workers. And so as we listen today, let's not just listen vicariously. Let's listen with an intention to continue the conversation, to continue the dialogue, continue to take peace as we understand it to our part of the world. Our dialogue today will be moderated by John Hubbaker. Most of you know John. He has been a minister among us for 40 years as a pastor and bishop. 26 of those years at the Manor Congregation, he's just completed that work. And is, as of June 1, has taken up a position, a full-time position with Brethren of Christ World Missions. At this point, I'll turn it over to John. To Warren Huffman's comments, I add my word of welcome to all of you, especially those who are our Muslim friends who have joined us for today. Welcome to a time of learning and dialogue. Our event this afternoon is a structured dialogue. Why do we hold a dialogue anyway? Well, there are several good reasons. It's a good way to present two views on an issue in an orderly way. It is quick and to the point. Listeners can think their own thoughts, prepare some questions, come to their own conclusions. And for us brethren in Christ, this particular dialogue is a very good way for us to learn about Islamic thinking directly from an Islamic leader. The subject of the dialogue, as many of you know, is the Bible and the Quran on the question of peace. And as you know already, our speakers are Shabir Ali on my left, Jay Smith on my right. Jay is a longtime Brethren in Christ Church missionary, currently lives in London, England with his wife and their three sons. In his childhood, he was the son of missionaries to India, and beginning with that background, he's become well-versed in Eastern and Western worldviews. Jay's been studying Islam for 25 years and working with Muslims in a variety of ways. He's been actively involved in teaching, debates, seminars, on university campuses and other venues in the United Kingdom and around the world. Uh, Shabir Ali is president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International here in Toronto. He lives here. He serves as an imam here. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies with an emphasis on biblical literature, that is, the Christian scriptures, the Jewish and Christian scriptures. He has a specialty in Quranic exegesis and is now a PhD candidate here at the University of Toronto. He travels internationally to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues. He's an accomplished Muslim scholar, author of numerous booklets and articles on Islam and comparative religions. He also hosts a weekly television program entitled Let the Quran Speak. Would you welcome our two presenters? Shabir and Jay are friends. They have been together in public dialogue or debate on four previous occasions. However, this is the first time they've done a dialogue on today's theme, the subject of peace in the scriptures of the Quran and the Bible. Jay is the one who proposed this subject for today for two reasons. One, because it's such a prominent teaching of Jesus and prominent at other places in the New Testament and also because it is a distinctive teaching and feature of the Brethren in Christ Church. 
um, let me repeat that Jay and Shabir are friends. If the dialogue becomes vigorous, which it well may, you may need to turn to your friend and say, in your row, and say, isn't it great what good friends they are? <laughs> uh, here's the format we'll follow. Uh, 25 minutes each for the speaker to present their initial presentation, then 10 minutes each for a response or rebuttal, then a question and answer time involving you, which I'll say more about in a few moments, and then a few minutes each for a summation and conclusion. We do have a timekeeper for the various sections of our, uh, the progress of this format, and so the timekeeper down front will be sometimes holding up signs or saying, time up, and this is not considered rude in a dialogue. This is considered essential in a dialogue. <laughs> The plan for the question and answer time is simply this. I hope you have paper with you. We were hoping to give you blank items of paper, pieces of paper when you came in, and I'm not sure we got that covered. At any rate, at any time during the presentations, when you think of a question, uh, jot it down legibly on paper, and at the top indicate, would you like to direct your question to Jay or to Shabir? And if you forget the names, it would be to the Christian side or the Muslim side. Put that at the top and send them to the outside of your section. And so ushers would be collecting them periodically, not every moment, but periodically they'll be collecting them and bringing them to my table. And then I'll arrange them and we'll have the men respond to a few of the questions. Depending on your interest, we cannot get to every question, but we will uh, pick responsive or sampling ones, representative ones for a response. We're ready now for our initial presentations. We'll begin with Jay Smith, and immediately, and we'll be followed by Shabir. Thank you, John. Good introduction. Thank you, Shabir, for being with us. This should be fun. <laughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Now this is a rare occasion. I, I rarely do debates where the Christians outnumber the Muslims. I don't think I've ever done one where there's been this many Christians at one time. Shabir, I hope you don't feel intimidated. I'm used to it, so I'm used to this kind of environment. <laughs> I want to thank you for all coming to this because I know this is something that's not usual for the Brethren in Christ and it's not even usual for Toronto. But what we're doing today is we're talking about peace. And as John has already mentioned, it's important to us. Uh, I think the dialogue is important because both religions, both Islam and Christianity, claim to be religions of peace. Yet there is much violence in the world today. It's a distinctive of the brethren in Christ. It's one of our great distinctives, and that's one reason why we've asked it to be at this day, on this hour, and also on this subject. Both Islam and Christianity also share other things in common. We both share the fact that we go to a authority for that which we believe, and that religious authority is scripture. For the Muslim, their scripture is the Quran and the traditions that embellish the Quran. And for us, it's the Old and New Testament. But for Christians, primarily, it's the New Testament. And I will zero in on that as I continue with my, my talk and my rebuttals later on. We also share that both religions use a context to understand those scriptures. For the Muslim, it's the Azbab al-Nuzul, which is the, the idea of looking and interpreting or understanding what each scripture is saying in the context that it was given. We would have the same as Christianity. We call it Bibl biblical exegesis. So we look at every verse and we are trying to understand what the author intended. Both Islam and Christianity believe in a progressive revelation. The revelation moves from one place to another, moves over time. For Islam, it moves from Mecca to Medina, two different places uh, where the revelation is referred to. We'll talk about that a little later. For Christianity, it moves from the Old Testament, the 1500 years up until the New Testament period, the New Covenant. And both religions share also a paradigm in that both uh, need to be modeled by an individual. For the Muslim, the model for Islam is Muhammad. And for the model for us, the paradigm for us, is Jesus Christ. 
But here with these two contexts is where the comparisons are problematic. Because for Islam, for the Quran, when you look at the Quran, you need to unpack and you need to look at the two different areas of revelation or the two different periods of revelation, which are referred to the two different cities where the Prophet lived. From Mecca, and that would refer from the year 610 up until 622, those 13 lunar years that he lived in Mecca, then moving on to Medina when he moved up in the Hijrah in 630, 622 up until 632 when he died, the last 10 years. And when you look at these two different periods of revelation, you will see that the revelation changes. In Mecca, it's a very peaceful environment. Muhammad was not a statesman, he was only a prophet. And as a prophet, he had certain responsibilities, and those responsibilities did not include the state. He was a minority in his own town. And as such, the revelations that were received, they reflect that environment. And when you look at the Meccan surahs, there's not an awful lot that we would disagree as Christians when we read the Meccan surahs. They focus around the end times. They focus around the monotheism, the idea that God is one. But then when he moved to Medina in 622, he then took on a different role. He became a statesman besides a prophet, a prophet and statesman. Very similar to what Moses did who also was in the business of creating a theocratic state and then maintaining that theocratic state. And in order to do that, the responsibilities of state then included violence, including use of the sword. So when he moved to Medina, because of those added responsibilities, the statesmen and also certainly the responsibilities of state, you can see that the revelations change. And so when you look at the Medinan surahs, the longer surahs, the material that's primarily at the front of the Quran, the first mostly at the front, you can see that there's an awful lot of violence in those verses. Now, Shabir will say, and rightly so, that he had to. That was one of the artifices, that was one of the needs of the state, and I would agree with them. There is an awful lot of violence when you're maintaining creating a theocratic state. But it's because of the fact that we have these two differences in the mu and, the, and the revelation changes between the revelations that I want to bring to fore that I would suggest, therefore, that those of us who are Christians who follow the paradigm of the Old Testament, which follows the, uh, the model of M Moses, so to speak, and moves to the New Testament, which follows the model of Jesus, when you look at those two models, that which Moses created and maintained a theocratic state back there in 1400 BC, by the time Jesus came, all of that was fulfilled in him, and what we have in the New Testament is not a state edifice. In fact, the kingdom of God is, is defined completely different. And the kingdom of God, which had been a theocratic state in the Old Testament, now becomes a relationship. When Christ comes, and uh, when he came in Matthew 18, 20, he defined exactly what that kingdom was. I remember I was doing a debate in uh, London back in 1999, and I was debating Sheikh Omar Bakri Muhammad. Do you know him, Shabir? He's a good friend of mine. Probably not of yours. Very radical Muslim, not liked by the state in England at all. He created the Mahajudun party there in Britain, one of the most radical group in Britain. Uh, we were good friends, uh, and we would, we've had about two or three debates ourselves in public. And I remember in the one debate we were doing in 1999, we were arguing this very point. What is the Khilafah? Where is the Khilafah? And he did a very eloquent job of defining what the Khilafah would look like there in Britain. And for about an hour, he defined what it would look like concerning how the judiciary would look like, what the police would look like, how the roles of men and women would change. And then after an hour, he turned to me and says, okay, Mr. Smith, where is your kilafa? Where is your state? And I said, well, I'm going to show it to you right now. And I said, I want all the Christians to raise their hands. Now, in that room, there was about a thousand radical Muslims. I could only get 300 Christians to come to that debate, and they did not want to raise their hands. I said, come on, Christians, I want you to raise your hands. And so they start putting their hands up little as they could. And then I said to Sheikh, I said, I want to show you right, right now. And I start numbering them. One, two, three. There is the kingdom of God right there. One, two, th there it is again. Look at that. One, two, three. And what I was doing is I was referring to what Jesus was saying in Matthew 18, 20, where he said, where there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am with you. That is the state we're talking about. It is not a place. It is not a piece of real estate. It cannot, it is not one place on earth, it is wherever people are in relationship to God, there is the kingdom. A totally different kingdom than what we're looking at in Islam, than what we're seeing, even the mosaic model. And it was right there in that room. I said to the Sheikh, now you go down and I want everybody who is there to go and talk to these people who have raised their hand. I want them to ask questions as to how they live, and there you will see the kingdom lived out. Because the kingdom we're talking about is not a place, it's a relationship. 
Christ, when he was asked what, uh, what he was to do uh, concerning taxes, in Matthew 22, just ch four chapters later, verse 21, when he was asked, should we pay taxes to Caesar, look at his response. He says, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's, creating already a separation of church and state. That which we give to Caesar belongs in this side, that which we give to the church belongs over here. The two are separated and neither the twain should meet. And for the last 2,000 years, we've tried to do just that. Now, not always so great. Sometimes we have failed. But certainly that has been the model, that has been the paradigm that we have tried to work towards. Because whenever the church and state are brought together, the state then corrupts the church. And that's where we've seen our dark periods of our history. And it is that that I look at today when I look at the two different covenants and I say, it's the later covenant, it's the covenant of Jesus Christ that I follow which has a totally different paradigm, which has terribly different influences, and of course, in that model, I'm not permitted to use violence. Not at all. There's no need for violence anymore. But that's not to say that there is not violence in the, in the Bible. There is violence in the Bible. And almost all of it is in the Old Testament. We've got to deal with the violence in the Old Testament. And I'll put my hands up, and I will admit, that I'll be the first to admit, Shabir, that the violence in the Old Testament is much greater than the violence in the Quran. I'll be the first to admit that. It is much greater. It's horrendous violence. In Joshua, chapter 6, verse 20, where Joshua commands the people to go in and kill all men, women, and children, even live animals. We don't see references like that in the Quran. And so it troubles us, those of us who follow the paradigm of Jesus Christ, when we read and we look back in the Old Testament, because we say, where is the peace that is there? And what are we going to do with the violence of the Old Testament vis-a-vis -vis the peace that we see in the person of Jesus Christ, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are we going to do with the horrendous verses, not only surrounding what happened in Jericho, what happened a few chapters later in the city of Ai? And here I've been helped by three of our theologians, uh, two of them from the Brethren in Christ, Dr. Terry Brenzinger and Dr. Luke Kiefer. And so when you hear one argument presented, it is so easy. And when you hear another one presented logically and consistently, then what do you do? This is the benefit of a dialogue. It's the dilemma of a dialogue. And as you see, so far at any rate, they are such good friends. <laughs> we have now experienced the longest part of our time together, the 25 minute initial presentations. We'll go in just a moment to a 10 minute response or rebuttal. Choose which word you wish. We'll begin with Jay and then go to Shabir. Uh, this is a good time, if you've not done so, to write down a question, address either to Jay or Shabir, send it to the outside of your section, and during these comments the ushers may come and uh, pick them up and bring them to me if there are any questions. We proceed, as I said, with Jay and Shabir. Terrific stuff. Thanks, Shabir. You really helped me a little bit in that um, you've given me a very sanitized view of your history. And I think we need to be careful here. Now, what you're hearing today is a 20th century, I would say, spin on what's happened in the 7th century. He did say, and I think you, I hope you picked it up, that many of the exegetes, the original or the primary exegetes, those are not exegetes, excuse me, the compilers of the traditions, and they are compilers, and when you look at the compilers of the tradition, you will see that many of them were writing in the 9th and 10th century, not in the 20th and the 21st century. And they, he would say that they atomized their material and they just basically looked and they tried to find scripture to support what they were doing at that time. The difficulty is that in history you always take that material that is closest to the event. And in order to understand what you have just done with Surah 9.5 and Surah 2, Ayah 190, and also uh, Surah 22, Ayah 39 to 40, which are all well-known references. I would have not gone to Surah 9.5. I know a lot of people like to. It's not my sword verse. I have a much better one. I'll show it to you in just a while. But when you look at these verses and you start unpacking them, you need to go to other sources than uh, men like you have used, than Shibli Amani, who is much more of a modern scholar. You need to go back to people from that time. You need to go back to Ibn Hisham. You need to go back to Ibn Ishaq. You need to go back to others like Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Dawud. You need to go back to uh, al tabari You need to go back to those people that were compiling what happened. In fact, they're the first people to compile what happened. You don't have anything earlier than that in any documented form. Ibn Hisham, who died in 833, Muhammad died in 632. That's within 200 years you have the first real biography of the Prophet's life. You need to go back to what he said was happening at that time. And when you go back to that time, when you go back to 
the, the, uh, the battles of Badr, in the battle of Uhud, in the battle of the trenches, 624, 625, 627. When you go to the battle of Badr, you say that they were attacked. Who was attacking who? Because when you read what Ibn Ishaq says, and when you read what Ibn Hisham said, who is his student, and al waqidi says, who is also a student, who, did, who wrote, who died in 835, what they were saying at that battle had nothing to do with them being, or defending what the Meccans were doing. Actually, the Meccans were on a caravan coming from Gaza back down to Mecca, and as they were passing across the plain of Badr, it was Muhammad that actually attacked them. Not defense whatsoever. They knew that this attack was going to happen, and so they went and they asked for reinforcements, knowing that they were going to be attacked, interestingly, during the month of Ramadan, the month of peace. So the question you did ask is, if they did initiate that attack, and remember Muhammad went to the Battle of Badr, which you're right, is, it, it, is a, it is a suburb, you might say, it's not too far away from Medina. When Muhammad went to the Battle of Badr in 624 with around 300 of his men, he was surprised to find there was a thousand there. He won that battle and he came back victorious, claiming that this was God's battle. It was God, it was God and the angels that were provided by God that won that battle for him. But then what would you expect the Meccans to do if they had been usurped? What would you do in that context? I know what I would do as a Christian. As a Christian, we're not permitted to use weapons. But these were not Christians at this time. And this was not a battle that had to do with the kingdom of God. This had a battle to do with, that had to do with their livelihood. They were coming back on a campaign. They were coming back uh, in a caravan in the, in the month of peace, not expecting to be attacked. So no wonder, a year later, they came up with their forces to then attack at the Battle of Uhud because they were trying to revenge what had happened the year before. And that's exactly what Ibn Hisham talks about. And when they attacked in that battle, they actually won that battle. Muhammad was gravely wounded, almost died in that battle. Seeming to reverse that which God had done the year before, it reverses and he comes back angered. But you're also not telling them what happened to the Jews. Those who were under the jurisdiction of Muhammad at that time. And that's what concerns me, because these are the people that actually were under his jurisdiction in a Khilafal state. And that means they are people that are under his titular, uh, under his titular head, politically speaking. And I'd like to know what would happen to me if I was in that same context. What we do know is that after the Battle of Badr, when he came back to the Battle of Badr, he then threw out the first day of the Jewish tribes, the Banu Kainuka family. After the Battle of Uhud in 625, he came back angered because of the fact that he had lost that battle, wounded, and he threw out the second remaining of the great three Jewish tribes, the Banu Nadir family. But then two years later, when you quickly went over the Battle of the Trenches, you never told them what happened after the Battle of the Trenches. You need to look at the whole history. The Battle of the Trenches, three years or five years, uh, excuse me, after he had moved to Medina, here was a man who did not belong to Medina. He came from Mecca. He was invited to come up to Mecca by the Ansar who were there because of the problems they had with the Jews at that time. He was to come to arbitrate between the Jews and the Ansar. And when he came there within two years, he started taking over much of the political head because of what happened at the Battle of Badr. Within three years then, in 627, after that, after that first Battle of Badr, a stalemate battle, battle because of the trenches, you're correct. What did he do to the last remaining Jewish tribe there, the Banu Qurayza family? You need to read it. It's there in Ibn Hisham. There are a number of sources where you can read what happened. He then attacked the Jews, the last remaining Jewish tribe there, because they did not support him. Some believe that they actually usurped him. Some believe that they went against the treaty, the Treaty of Medina, which is a treaty which is interesting because I've read the Treaty of Medina, and it's a treaty I would not sign as a Jew because it stipulates that... Muhammad would be the arbiter between man and God. I would not refuse. I would refuse to have a man like Muhammad as my arbiter. Yet what happened to these Jewish tribes? 800 men had their throats slit in one afternoon by Muhammad. Now why don't you tell that part of the story? See, that's the violence we're talking about. And that's the violence that disturbs me. Because if the same thing were to be reproduced today in the 21st century, if Muslims were going to come to Britain or going to come to Toronto, if they're going to come and they are going to say that we have to center into a treaty, and if we renege on that treaty, if Muhammad is your prophet and he's your model, if he is the one that is the paradigm for all of mankind, are you going to do the same thing to me? That's the difficulty we're having. We've got to go back and ask what then happened after the Battle of the Trenches. Because when we look at the Prophet's life, and you need to go back to Ibn Hisham, look at his life and list the number of campaigns that he belonged, the number of campaigns that he actually participated in. Over 29 battle campaigns from 624 up to 632, the last eight years of his life. 39 that he planned on top of that. Were these all defensive battles? Somewhere. 
But if you look at the battles and you put them in the context, you will find that a good number of them were offensive. And what's more is to look and see what happened immediately after his death in 632, when Abu Bakr for the next two years, and then Umar for the next 10 years, and then Abu uh, uh, Uthman for the next 14 years. When you look out all the way up to Ali from the last four years of what we call the rightly guided Kadis, when you look at that 44 year, that 40 year period from 624 up to 660, what they call the Rashidun period, the golden era of Islam, look and see how many battles took place. Look and see what lands were conquered. Look and see. What cities were devastated and taken over? Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. All because of defense? Don't stop there. Continue on and see what the Muslims did when they decimated North Africa. We don't talk about the conquest in school today. Very few books have been written on the conquests. Yet when you look at the history of Islam, following the model of the Prophet himself, by the end of the seventh century, Spain in the west, all the way to India in the east, that whole swath of land was taken over by Islam, not because of defense. Not because of defense. See, a lot of that land belonged to the Byzantine world. A lot of that land belonged to my church. There were many churches in North Africa that were decimated, destroyed. Why isn't Muslims are talking about that today? I'm sure you would admit there was a lot of violence. I've heard in your, in your speeches you talk about the violence that followed the life of the Prophet. We need to go back and redress history and we need to ask these disturbing questions and as disturbing as they are, the question I ask as a Christian, we don't find this kind of violence in Christianity in the first 400 years. Look at the early church. They followed the example of Jesus Christ. The early church refused to use the sword. The early church was persecuted as you were saying Muhammad was persecuted. Yet how did Jesus respond when he was persecuted? Did he respond with a sword? Absolutely not. The one time a sword was used by Philip, he turns uh, by Peter, he turns towards Peter and says, Put away your sword, for he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Jesus Christ, Son of God. Jesus Christ, God incarnate. When he was there being led to the cross, when he was being whipped, and he was being ridiculed as he went through the streets. That Jesus Christ, he could have called the angels to protect him. He refused to do that. He went willingly to the cross. That's my example. That's my paradigm. And that's what we have to do as well. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love Jesus because I love the example of the church that followed him. The example of the church who refused to take up the sword. And it wasn't until Constantine finally came up and screwed everything up. I'm sorry about Constantine, but I don't care for him. Constantine came in mates and brought the church and state together. And from Constantine all, everything went wrong because he brought the church and state together. The very thing Christ stood against, Constantine somehow, somehow misunderstood. Folks, isn't it great to have Jesus? Folks, isn't it great, the example we see in the early church, isn't it great that the disciples, every one of them, was killed except for John because of what they believed. They refused to use the sword. That's the gospel I'm looking for. That's the peace I'm looking for. And that's the peace I, dem I ask of you to show me in the Quran. I haven't gone back to the, the verse that I would like to go back. I'll save that for it. I don't go to Surah 9.5. There's a much better one. But you'll have to wait because I see my time's up. Jay, I think, has a right to be angry because uh, the way he sees it is that I have hidden and covered up certain obvious things that should have been mentioned in my uh, initial presentation. Uh, but I think he's mistaken in that I did not deliberately overlook anything. Uh, the initial presentation um, was used up in uh, pulling together all of the verses of the Quran that relate to our subject as much as that would be possible within the time frame, frame that I was given, but also to lay out the interpretive framework that will help us to understand any verse of the Quran. I've stressed the intertextual and the contextual readings that the Quran must be subjected to. So I wasn't hiding anything. At the same time, uh, Jay thinks that uh, I should have referred to the seer of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Ishaq in the recension of Ibn Isham, which he says, that, uh, uh, whom he says died 200 years after the Prophet Muhammad. So he thinks that we ought to rely on writings which were written close to 200 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad in order to understand Muhammad best. 
But what I've done instead is I've followed the scholarly discourse which says that the Quran is the most authentic document we have concerning the life and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. And the Sira and Magazi works which were written a couple of years, a hundred years after him are not so reliable. So if we want to understand who Muhammad is, we do not interpret the Quran in the light of the Sira, but we interpret the Sira and the Maghazi works in the light of the Quran. And particularly we can note, for example, this is not my own spin and rereading of it in the 20th century. We have a writing here from Lloyd Ridgeon in a book uh, entitled War and Peace in the World's Religions. Writing on Islam, Ridgeon tells us, Therefore the Maghazi literature provided the Muslims with a myth of unity and expansion reflecting the aims of the new dynasty, the Abbasids. This had to do with the political milieu in which they lived. It, precisely the things that I've emphasized in my previous presentation. So I wasn't hiding anything. Moreover, I'm not defending Muslims here tonight. I admit that uh, Muslims have done some horrible things, and people of other faiths too have done some horrible things in history. But I was speaking about the teachings of the Quran in particular. Is the Quran a book about peace? And I think that I've established that very clearly with the evidence that I've called within the interpretive framework that I've given. Jay did not follow that interpretive framework. In fact, Jay, I think you have contradicted yourself here tonight based on what you have presented elsewhere. Because elsewhere, and in other talks, Jay argues that the Sira and Maghazi and Hadith literature are not dependable because they're written so late. And tonight, he wants us to believe that they are dependable because they paint Muhammad as a violent individual. But I'm putting before you that the Quran, the earliest document about the Prophet Muhammad, shows him to not be a violent individual. What about the Jews of Banu Qurayza? He says that 800 of them. There's nothing about that in the Quran. The most the Quran says in Surah 33 is that the Prophet Muhammad had an engagement with the other people. He slew some and he took some as captive. The numbers are not given. The numbers which are given in the Maghazi literature are grossly exaggerated. If you think of 800 people having their, slow th their, their throats slit in one evening, and then where are they buried? We already spoke about the Battle of the Trenches. If this occurred exactly after the Battle of the Trenches, the obvious place to bury them would be in the trenches. But the reports say that they were buried in the marketplace of Medina. Now imagine, after going through all of the trouble of digging the trenches, now you go build, dig the graves of these slain individuals somewhere else. My explanation for this is that when these materials were written, they didn't have it all together and people invented things. If Muslims wanted to pursue a violent approach to non-Muslims, they wanted the Prophet Muhammad as their model, and if they could not find him as a model violent individual, they had to mythologize him, invent the violence that they needed uh, for their own justification. What about the number of battles that the Prophet Muhammad is said to have fought in these Maghazi and Sira literature? Well, uh, he mentioned Shibli Nomani. Shibli Nomani, I believe, is uh, quite uh, adept in what he has done. He has combed the literature thoroughly, and he has shown the discrepancies in what people have claimed. They have claimed that the Prophet went in a certain battle, whereas it was a recognizance mission. It wasn't actually a battle, it wasn't an engagement with the enemy. And so they wanted to drum up the number of battles to justify their own uh, violence that they were inflicting uh, on others. What about uh, the Battle of Badr? Was this uh, an offensive uh, uh, launched by the Muslims to attack a caravan? Here too, Shibli, Here too, Shibli Mamani in his book, The Seerah of the, of the Messenger of God, uh, analyzes the passages in the Seerah works and their relationship to the Quran, and he shows that the Quranic evidence bears testimony that the Muslims, at the time of leaving their city, thought that they were going to face the enemy who was going to attack them in a large number. Whereas the Maghazi works say that the Prophet Muhammad and his followers left their city to attack the caravan and it was when they were outside of the city that they got news that a large army is coming to defend the caravan. And then they had to de decide what they're going to do, whether to turn back or to face the enemy. Whereas the Quran itself in Surah 8 shows that the Muslims in verse number 7, before leaving Medina, already had to decide are they going to go face this overwhelming odds uh, or, or, or not. So he shows that there's a great discrepancy. What's to be trusted in the case of this discrepancy is the Quran over and above the Maghazi literature. So in, I don't believe that there's any...
Anything that Jay has said that overturns my initial presentation, I agreed that he has a right to be angry because he, he understood that I was hiding something, uh, and that could make somebody really angry. But um, folks, uh, I, I wasn't uh, hiding anything. On the other hand, I think that Jay, while he has admitted that uh, the violence in the Old Testament is much greater than in the Quran, and these are his words, which I've written, written down as soon as he spoke them, he... He, he seems to think that the New Testament presents a different picture of morality and we should guard against this. He brought me actually greetings from our good friend uh, James White and James White uh, uh, has written in his book The God Who Justifies on page uh, 61 uh, in response to those Christians who may think okay that was the God of the Old Testament now in the New Testament things are different. In response White has this to say there is only one God and the God of the Old Testament is identical in every way to the God of the New. So we cannot uh, look at two different moralities here. Why is the New Testament then different? Uh, in his article on Jihad in the Blackwell Companion to the Quran, the Jewish writer uh, Reuben Firestone explains uh, the situation in which the, both the Talmud and the New Testament was, was, were written. Here we're talking about the context now the context here was different. The New Testament and the Talmud were written at a time when Rome dominated and there was no hope either from among the Jews or from among the Christians that somehow a political struggle will result in any victory. So a passive approach was taken. And this is particularly in page number 313 of the Blackwell uh, Companion to the Quran in which Reuven Firestone has, um, um, has laid out this case. And one can see this to be true. Jesus, according to the New Testament, was the Messiah who was expected to rule on the throne of David. So that the verse that was quoted about this says that God said to him, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The imagery was that Je Jesus would sit in a political rule on a throne that was left vacant by David, and that God would have it such that Jesus would be resting his feet on the slain bodies of his enemies. It was to be a political battle, a military confrontation. But when that could not work, the New Testament writers, writing in a milieu in which they dared not be represented as the terrorists of their day, they wrote things like Romans 13, Romans 13 and 1 Peter in which it is entirely pacifist. You submit yourself to the ruling authority of the day, do not resist. And this is why Jesus is represented in the Gospel of John as saying, my kingdom is not of this world. So this is a later rewriting. John, the last of the four Gospels now, takes the Messiahship and gives it a different meaning. It's not... Oh, any more about sitting on the throne of David in this life, at least not in the first coming, but when he comes back, the book of Revelation tells us what, tells us what he will do. He will have a major confrontation with his enemy, his tongue itself will be of a sword, and he will slay everyone except the false prophet and, uh, and the Antichrist who will be thrown into the fire. Everyone else, according to the book of Revelation, will be slain by Jesus when he comes back and engages the enemy in that major battle. So the battle motif is present in the Old and in the New Testament. Christians are peaceful, but despite the Bible. And some Muslims are violent, but despite the teachings of the Quran. Thank you. And in writing on paper questions for consideration, you have sent a flood of manuscripts to my desk. This is a delightful and vexing situation. Delightful because you are so keenly interested and you know how to ask tough questions. Vexing because I'll never get to all 600 questions. No, there are not 600, but there are too many. Uh, and, men, we did not resolve, I think, whether in this section, which is to be brief, I'll pose a question to one man. He has two minutes to respond. The other has one minute to respond to the response or to rebut the rebuttal or whatever words you wish. Do you men want to do this from your tables or do you want to come up here for each one? Do you have a preference? We can do it right here. We got some All right. You have your microphones, and so I'll pose the questions here. A two-minute response and one-minute rebuttal. The timekeeper will indicate when the time is up. First to Jay, you talked about the decrease of violence throughout the Old Testament. Then what about the killing of the enemies of the Jews following Purim? 
which occurred late in Israel's history, but prior to the birth of Jesus. Yeah, sure, you're saying that. Yeah, and I would have to admit that there are some there are some exceptions to the rules. What you will do find what you will find is when you look at the uh, the violence that we have in the Old Testament. The violence that we do have in the Old Testament is always pointing to the peace that will come after, the peace uh, of, of the person of the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. There will be all seas. When you look at also the, many of the different the conflicts that you do have in the Old Testament, when you ask, are these all on that regression? Do they all fit into that regression? And they don't exactly fit into that regression. I would be the first to admit that. But they do point to the fact that there will be, there will be the Prince of Peace that will then take over, then he will then bring about that peace that is always promised. And when that happens in the New Testament, thank God, it is not something that the disciples decide to redact later on because of the fact that Christ unexpectedly was crucified. It's what he intended to do. And the kingdom that he does bring about is not a kingdom that will be the same as the kingdom of David, that is a land-based kingdom, a kingdom that it does require violence uh, to create and maintain a theocratic state it will be a kingdom that is based on a relationship and i think because of that we need to be careful that we don't look literalistically and atomize every incident that we see in the old testament we need to see the flow of scripture that we that we see there and we see the flow is that god was preparing a people preparing a place some of the people not didn't always follow god's commandments correctly uh, some people would suggest that even the Joshua account, when you look in Joshua 6.20, it was Joshua that claimed that they were to go kill men, women, and children, and all animals. We don't see the necessary that God is saying that there. So we have to ask, is there human also intervention that stands against what the altruistic view of God is? And I would say yes, there is certainly that case. But the flow is towards the Prince of Peace. The flow then was result in the Prince of Peace. Over 300 references to who that Prince of Peace is. Over 300 references, prophecies that specifically talk about that man, and he is Jesus Christ. I believe that uh, Jay is doing what he's, accusing, uh, what he's accusing me of doing, in that he's not giving us the full picture. It, it is indeed in the Old Testament God who says, go and kill men, women, children, suckling, infants, uh, oxen, sheep, and everything. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, for example. And then uh, Saul doesn't carry out the full commandment because he saves some of the good livestock for himself and the king of the Amalekites. And for this reason, God repents. He is sorry that he had made Saul king. And then Samuel, coming to reprimand uh, Saul, eventually completes the job by personally uh, chopping uh, the, the head off the, the king of the Amalekites. Uh, so it is God who actually says this, uh, Jay. I don't believe that there's any escape from that. And uh, the peace that the Messiah is uh, expected to bring in comes in after his violent overthrow of the enemy, rather his slaying them. Uh, and then, yes, he in institutes a period of peace, but that comes after the violence. But that's the same thing that the Muslim terrorists are arguing. The next question to you, Shabir. In Christianity, the underlying motivation to be at peace with one another is the love of God. We love because he has first loved us, quoting from the New Testament. What is the underlying motivation in Islam to be at peace with others? Well, the underlying uh, motive for peace in, in the Quran is that God has created all creatures and uh, he wants his creatures to live in harmony with each other. He said that uh, had it not been for people uh, differing with each other, people would have remained at peace. And then he calls us back to this situation of peace. One of the names of God in the Quran is as salam which means the peace. And uh, Muslims, in, in a prayer that they often recite after the daily ritual prayers, they say, uh, Allahumma anta salam, O God, you are peace. Wa minka salam, and from you peace comes. Wa ilayka yarji wa salam, and peace returns to you. Fahayina rabbana bis salam, so cause us, our Lord, to live in, in peace. Wa adhilna al jannata dar salam, and uh, admit us into paradise, which is the abode of peace. It seems that peace permeates the entire ethos of what Islam is really about. And this is why the Muslim greeting is uh, As-Salaamu Alaikum, which means peace be upon you. Uh, the Quran, as we have said, uh, encourages people to enter into peace in, in, a, in a complete way. Udkhulu fi silmi kafa, which the, uh, the commentators uh, styled as enter into Islam completely. But it doesn't say Islam in this place, it says peace. And that's what it means. Uh, altogether then, the Quran represents uh, the initiative towards peace, which is in, in fact marks it off 
as very different from the teachings that we have seen in the biblical ethos. Uh, a verse of the Quran in Surah 8, verse number 67, has similarly been interpreted by Muslim scholars as an incitement towards killing captives. But actually, when we trace back the earliest writings about this, even in the historical development of later literature, we can see how the original verse meant one thing, and they're styling it to mean another thing. The original meaning seems to be that which was captured by an early exegete, Muqatul bin Sulaiman, who said that this was a reference to the fact that previous prophets could have killed off their enemies, but the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, for the first time, is being told by God, take them as captives instead of killing them off. And that, that again is in contrast uh, to the actions of some Muslims who would be head journalists. The underlying theme is what we're talking about in the Quran. Is there an underlying theme of peace? I, I would say yes, I would agree with Shabir. There is an underlying theme of peace. It, there is both an internal peace and there is also external peace. The greater and the lesser jihad that mo people talk about most popular today. The difficulty I have with that is the greater jihad, that is the the uh, peace that is internal is something for Muslims. It's the lesser jihad that bothers me, because that impinges upon me. That impinges upon those who then are, uh, as we see in the history of Islam, and certainly in the latter part of my, the Prophet's life, not only impinge on the Jews, but also impinge on those who stood against him, like Asma, the poetess, whose only crime was that she did po uh, poetic verse against the Prophet. And there is example after example in the, the Siddha of the Prophet, which though uh, Shabir does not like to claim is authoritative, he has nothing earlier. That is the earliest material we do have. And for by virtue of that, we have to go on it as that what probably that comes closest to that which the Prophet did. And if the Prophet did that, then it disturbs me, because that's not the peace that I see in Jesus Christ. Ready for the next question. And we're intending for this question and answer period to take about 20 minutes, so we're not quite halfway through this. We have time for a couple of more questions. If my alternation is correct, we're turning to Jay for the next question. Given that Christians are to be peacemakers and their primary allegiance is to the kingdom of God, doesn't God still use nations to bring about the destruction of evil movements? I interpret the question to mean even today, not just long ago. That's, that's a hard one for a lot of us who are brethren in Christ because we're asked that all the time, and that is as a pacifistic uh, denomination, what do we do? Uh, with Romans 13, where we are to obey governments, we are to follow their jurisdiction, God places governments in place, and those of us who live under the auspices of governments where we are protected, we are protected by the state here, and therefore those who protect us are the ones who actually go to war for us, are we not therefore being parasitical in, by, in holding on and in enjoying the peace that we have here. The only answer I could say to that is God does institute violence, he has so historically, uh, I can only understand Romans 13 in the fact that God does control what is happening in the, in, in the world today. The difficulty that I would have is that I would not participate in that violence. As the brethren in Christ, we are not to participate in that violence. Our responsibility is for the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God does not come through violent men. It does not come through violent means. So my responsibility, certainly as a man of the cloth, my responsibility also as a brethren in Christ, is to make sure that if there is any violence, I stand against it. That if there is any violence in the name of God, I condemn it. Whether it's the Crusades, the Inquisition, the colonial experience, I'm the first to condemn it. Not because I like or dislike, it's because my Lord Jesus Christ would have condemned it. Therefore, he is my example, he is my model. And as if he condemns it, I have to condemn it. So we do not use the sword, we don't need to, because the kingdom of God is everywhere. In fact, I would say it thrives best in violence. In hostile environments, you look back the last 2,000 years of our existence, you will see that where there is violence and where there is hostility, there the church has grown the fastest. So there's something to say about the fact that we do not go out with violence. We don't need to. Shabir seemed to suggest that when he was talking about the, the uh, agreement, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the one chance when there was peace, when he refused to use weapons to take over Mecca, that is when Islam grew the fastest. And I, thought, I praise God because he's actually using our paradigm. He's coming home. Can you see? He's on the way. <laughs> Thank you, Jay, for that positive spin on my, my statements. <laughs> I have tried to show that this paradigm is actually built into the Quranic teachings as much as uh, we can understand the verses uh, within its uh, text and its context. Uh, the Quran does allow uh, for violence to be used to right wrongs, to 
uh, to enforce justice where this is needed. Uh, Surah 4 verse 75 speaks about uh, the men and women who are being oppressed. Weak people, uh, children for example, who are crying out, will there be someone to protect us? Will there be someone to help us against these oppressors? In that case, uh, a Muslim government would have the responsibility uh, to respond uh, and to remove whatever oppression or aggression is directed against uh, innocent folks. So the Quran is not uh, entirely pacifist, and I, I did not mean to give that impression, uh, though the question gives us the opportunity now to highlight uh, more the fact uh, that the Quran does allow uh, for violence to be used in a limited sense. In my presentation itself, I alluded to that. Thank you. The next question to Shabir, is, and it's a fairly tough one. You're used to that. You've worked with Jay and others. Uh, is it not true that Christians uh, are, according to the Islamic faith, are infidels, and infidels are to be killed or done away with in order that the Muslim may be assured of a place in paradise? Well, paradise is very wide, and paradise has a place for every creature of God. I mean, Muslims do not have to do away with Christians in order to have a place for themselves in paradise. In fact, if a Muslim deliberately kills a, a non-Muslim, or anyone else for that matter, uh, without proper justification, uh, which are, I mean, would be quite limited, uh, that uh, would guarantee the Muslim himself uh, or herself a place in, in hell. So I do not uh, see that that really is a legitimate way of viewing things. Uh, on the other hand, the idea, the term infidel itself needs to be qualified because in the Bible you have this idea of people uh, prostituting themselves to other gods. Well, in, in the Quran, the idea is that people deny the thing which they know. So they commit what is called in the Quran kufr or denial. Uh, that only occurs when the message of Islam has been presented to a person with uh, a certain level of persuasion and clarity such that God would require of this individual now that you must listen to this message. Sort of what is said in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 19. When that prophet comes to you, if you do not hearken to that prophet, I will require it from you. But it is God who has the right to judge whether an individual has received that message well enough or not. It is not for Muslims or anyone else to judge. I cannot say that I've spoken to a Christian and I've convinced him that this is the word of God and he's not accepting it. How do I know what is in his mind? It is only God who can judge him or me. I can only say I've done the best I can, but I hope that God will guide this individual or at least uh, forgive me for my mistakes. Perhaps I presented it wrong. Perhaps I misrepresented the faith. Perhaps Muslims with recent violent acts have made Muslims so terribly anti-Muslim that no matter what we say now, nobody's going to listen to the message about Islam. So in a situation like that, we Muslims are not on any moral high ground to condemn anyone to hell or to any other place, but we can only hope that God in his mercy will admit everyone, as much as this is possible, uh, to the place that will reflect his mercy and graciousness to all of his creatures. Thank you. Well, that's the most inclusive I've ever seen you be. I'm glad to hear that. I'm not used to working with people that uh, embrace everybody and, make, uh, and get, make paradise wide enough for the rest of us. I don't think many Muslims would take the, the line that Shabit is taking. I think that you look uh, in the scriptures, there is reference after reference that it is a very exclusivist message, as we have an exclusive message in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everyone is permitted. There are seven levels of heaven. And I know Shabir would, would say that the, the different levels include different individuals. There are also seven levels of hell. And we are, as the Ali Kitab, in two of the higher levels, thank God. But here's the difficulty. What are you going to do with the verses that do stipulate that you must, that we must, not only accept that Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet, the shahada, the statement of faith that all Muslims must say. I can do the first part of that statement. I cannot do the second. What's going to happen to me? Now, Shabir will be nice and he'll allow me to come on in, but it's not Shabir that I fear. It's his scripture that I fear, and it's his prophet. The next question we direct to Jay. Uh, can you comment on the law of abrogation and how that impacts Shabir's argument for peace in the Quran? And for the benefit of some of us, you'll need to clarify. We'll give him an extra moment or two to clarify the law of abrogation. No, I can do it within two minutes. I think it's pretty easy. In Surah 2, 106, when I say surah, I mean book. Uh, when I say ayah, I mean verse. And also in Surah 16, Ayah 1 1, you have what we call the law of abrogation. And the reason is very simple. When you look at the Quran, uh, you will see there's lots of verses that contradict each other. There's about 220 that we have found. Uh, maybe Shabir has found a few less. But certainly what we do know 
is when you look at those contradictions, they've got to be alleviated. And so the best way to alleviate them is to build in on a law of abrogation so that which precedes the first abrog uh, is abrogated by uh, the later. The mansuk uh, verses are abrogated by the nasil, nasik verses that come later. And so therefore, the Medinan verses which are all later then abrogate that which is the Meccan verses which come earlier. Now in the context of peace, if you look at Meccan surahs as peaceful, they are then abrogated by the Medinan surahs which are all, which not all, but many of them are quite violent. And I have 149 verses here, I can give this to you afterwards, which come out of the Medinan surahs. It's these verses that are later, that are more authoritative, that my friends in Britain are the ones are, are, who are going to, who are reading these verses and are coming to the conclusions that they're coming to. Shabir, I think, does a very fair job of trying to exegete them out as best he can using a 20th century overlay in a grid. Most of my friends do not do that. They go back to the earliest traditions. They look at the Medinan surahs as the most authoritative part of the Quran, and they're coming to the conclusions they're coming to. They would refuse, therefore, to this just uh, wipe it off, certainly the Medinan surahs, as nothing more than abrogated verses. They are not the abrogated verses. They are the ones that do the abrogating. They are the more troublesome verses. That is why, uh, as a Christian, when I look at re progressive revelation from the Old to the New Testament, we go the other direction, as I said earlier. We go from violence that we see in the Old Testament to the peace that we see in the New Testament. Thank God we go that direction and not the other way. Thank you, Jay, for being so generous uh, and gracious with me tonight. Uh, you don't miss an opportunity to point out how clever I'd be. In, in, in <laughs> <laughs> but in, in response to the question, um, Jay is following the construct that early commentators put on the Quran. But uh, I have tried to step back from that construct because we, we can see the, the violence to which it can contribute. Basically what the exegete said was that there are verses which speak about peace, but they have been abrogated by verses which speak about violence. So the final message of the Quran, according to them, is violence. They, they, they prove their case by referring to Surah 2 verse 106 and Surah 16 verse 101, just like Jay said, but I think that they are wrong. And I agree with uh, John Burton of the University of Edinburgh in his book, The Sources of Islamic Law, in which he has traced the history of how Muslims arrived at that complicated doctrine and that rereading of the Quran. They have read the Quran wrong, and we should let the Quran speak for itself. Every verse of the Quran is entirely valid. Each has a certain context, a certain um, situation, and we should understand the context and apply the verses accordingly. We will take one more question and the response, and this one goes to you, Shabir. Since we hear that Islam intends to fill and rule the world, is this in fact found in the Quran, and is it to be done peacefully? There are some verses of the Quran which say that God has revealed the message of the Quran so that it will supersede every other faith. And uh, the classical commentators took this to mean that the Quran will gain political uh, ascendancy and, and Muslims will have political rule over above every other nation. And uh, as I said, this is what fit their expansionist milieu at the time. Uh, this obviously has not happened and uh, many of us looking at it today would uh, say that what is meant here is that the Quran uh, supersedes the other faiths in that if God had revealed a certain message for a previous nation, then the Quran comes to give you the final will and testament of God. And it is in this sense that we understand the verses which speak about the abrogation. Uh, as uh, John Burton has pointed out, the verse in Surah 2, verse 106, speaks about the Quran abrogating the rules which were given in the previous testament. Just like Christians think that the New Testament abrogates the laws of the Old, Muslims should believe that the Quran abrogates the laws of both the Old and New Testaments, uh, so that uh, the Quran gives us the final will and testament of God. What we understand then is that the Quran uh, came to establish a superior uh, intellectual approach to religion than was previously known, and we see this in the Quranic approach to things where Muslims are finding now that the Quran from many different angles uh, proves itself to be the veritable word of God. Uh, Jay thinks that there are contradictions in the Quran. I think that uh, nothing that has been pointed out uh, about contradictions in the Quran are really contradictions. They're examples of misunderstandings of the Quran, but once we understand the Quran correctly in its text and context, we see that the Quran is in fact free of contradictions. On the other hand, to give Jay something to respond to, just to make it more lively, some time ago <laughs> I wrote a, a pamphlet, 101 Contradictions in the Quran, Jay and some of it uh, in the Bible, 
and Jay and his uh, colleagues uh, uh, try to respond to that, but in their response, they actually admit that many of them are actual examples of contradictions in the text as the text is today. So he has to deal with that. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Don't you love him? <laughs> actually, if you look at the title that we gave back to you at the debate we had in the 1990s, 101 cleared up contradictions of the Bible. It was the Bible, not the Quran. They haven't been yet cleared up. There's 220 that we could give to you. Now, it's interesting that he uses Surah 16, Ayah 101, and he misinterprets it. Let me read it for you. It says, and when we change a verse in place of another, and Allah knows best what he sends down. I don't see scripture here. We're not talking about previous scripture. This is a verse within the Quran. Even the, the exegetes here say a verse of the Quran. They even help you out, uh, Shabir. I don't know if you like uh, Hilali or Khan, but I, I kind of like them because they say exactly what the Quran is saying. What's more, if you want to talk about is the, and this is the question that we're really answering, should Islam dominate? Look at Surah 8, Ayah 39, and fight them until there is no more fitna, that is disbelief. And the religion will all be for Allah alone. Now, I don't know how you can get around that one. That seems to suggest that there is a program here, and that is to take over. Well, thank you, men, for your responses to these questions. Again, thanks to you, the audience. I, it is painful for me to have to leave so many questions unpresented because there were some very good ones here. There were some repeats, and so I tried to pick the one that summarized best the others. But thank you for what you've presented. Thank to you men for your responses. You can see what great fun it will be when someday you come to a platform and debate Jay or debate Sabir and get, in, uh, at, at, get involved in this level. Now, we have one more feature or two to close out, and that is this. We want to give each man an opportunity for some summation or conclusion, and the two men agreed that, in, that they'll combine it in this way. Uh, first, let me get my sequence right. Uh, Jay will have a five-minute summation, and then Sabir will have seven minutes for summation and conclusion. And then Jay's two minutes of conclusion will come after that. So first Jay, then Shabir, and then back to Jay, and then I'll come with our closing. I think we've heard today a, a very engaging uh, person in Shabir Ali. I like Shabir because he's the kind of guy I can take home to tea, to my mom, introduce her to. Not all the rest of my friends my mom cares for. Now, my mom's no longer living, but uh, when she used to come down to Speaker's Corner, she used to put her chair right behind me when I was up on the ladder, and she'd wag her fingers at all the men that would call me names, <laughs> especially when they called me a bastard. <laughs> for obvious reasons, she was sitting right there. <laughs> I used to introduce them to my mother after they said that. We get called all kinds of names, Shabir. Not, I really love you because you don't call me names, but you do crucify me with some of the things you say. You do a good job. He is clever, and I think it's good because the exegetical model that he is using is a model that I like. It's a model, though, I don't find many Muslims using today. The exegetical model taking the context of the modern day and taking to what, in many respects, Shabir has to say living in Canada, a country where there is tolerance. And applying that model to the scriptures, you can see the difficulty he has as he has to unpack every scripture and try to redress it and try to re-impack it and try to reform it so that it is not only politically correct, but that it's so sanitized that it can be acceptable by the wider audience today. And it is today, and it is in the West. And I find that fascinating because the West that he lives in is a West that is based on Judeo-Christian principles, the principles that I see in my Bible. And it is those principles that I am proud of. It is those principles that follow the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we're losing some of those principles, and there is still a memory, and unfortunately, some of that memory is more opaque in some nations than others. And we're having a real problem holding those principles intact there in Britain, in London, where I live. We're worth much further gone than you are here. One of those principles that I love is the freedom of speech. 
I have to use it every day, every Sunday. I get up on that ladder and I am in one of the greatest places on earth for the freedom of speech. Sometimes, Shabit, I'd love to invite you to come over there and we can go toe to toe in front of the crowd where they do heckle. They don't keep quiet. They're not gentlemanly. But you know, the interesting thing is I wouldn't want them to be any different because it's at that place that you learn exactly how great and how valuable the freedom of speech is. And yet it was Muslims who wanted to introduce the incitement to religious hatred law in 2006. It was uniquely Muslims that wanted to introduce that because they did not want us to talk about the Prophet and they did not want us to talk about the Quran, to, in, to either decry that or to criticize that. And in some countries today, you cannot do that. The C-295 law in Pakistan stipulates that if anybody criticizes the Quran or criticizes the Prophet, it's a capital offense. offense. And that is a law I don't want to bring to Britain. I don't want to see introduced here or anywhere else. But where does that law come from? And where do you think it was birthed? Jesus Christ, who allowed people to criticize him. Jesus Christ, who allowed people to ridicule him. Jesus Christ, who allowed people to kill him. Yes, God on the cross. And he was on that cross. Though you take him off the cross in Surah 4, 157, we keep him there. Because if he was not on the cross, if he did not die, then I'm damned. And so is everybody here, including you, Shabir. That's why I want to make sure that I can proclaim that fervently openly and that I can take any scripture that decries that and stands against that and openly criticize it in the public sphere I have to because it embellishes and also models what my Jesus Christ was doing and what he did and what the entire history of mankind was pointing towards and that was that one event the crucifixion of Jesus Christ if I cannot have that freedom and if I'm not permitted to proclaim it openly, and if I'm not permitted to criticize and critique those scriptures that do away with that crucifixion, then we all are going to follow the route of many countries that are already going down that. Censorship, not ability to speak openly, and not ability to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ freely. It is that exegetical method that he uses the 21st century overlay that stands against many of those that we're finding from many of my Muslim friends, not only in the United Kingdom, but as I go around the world, I come across many of these radicals who are going back to that, those scriptures, the Quran, and, what they, and the way they interpret it bothers me because when I look at my Bible, I can see that the many freedoms, not just the freedom of speech, but the freedom to propagate and the freedom to also invite, and it is inviting, and it also the freedom to live morally as Christ taught us to live, but only Christians that that is impinged upon, not others who live outside the family of God these freedoms I see being eroded all over the world so I bring you back to Jesus and I bring you back to the exegetical model that I see in the New Testament if you really want peace you know where to find him if you really want to find a paradigm of peace you know where to go and I ask the people like Shabir Ali stand up and also help their brethren to understand that much of the Quran that he's talking about needs to either be reinterpreted or needs to be thrown away because it's those verses that stand against these freedoms that I only find in the gospel of Jesus Christ that I want to see proclaimed. Thank you, Jay, for those uh, closing uh, and uh, some closing comment. Well, you, your summation and your closing comments will come later on. But uh, thank you for that summation. It was, uh, I think, an excellent overview of what has happened here tonight. Uh, I myself am very gr grateful uh, that God has given me the opportunity to live in a wonderful country such as Canada. Of course, we realize that the uh, intellectual exchange we have had here this evening would not have been possible in some other countries. So we do have to count uh, our blessings. It is through this kind of intellectual exchange that we come to understand and appreciate uh, other communities better. Uh, from other side, our side of the fence, we may have had suspicions, doubts, misgivings uh, about others, but in hearing the arguments from others, we can see that uh, we have basically two faith communities here represented tonight, uh, represented by people who sincerely believe in what they say. And uh, the, the matter of faith has become so complex that in one evening we can hardly deconstruct for a person what he has taken his whole lifetime to construct in his or her own mind. So Jay's mind is made up one way, my mind seems to be made up the other way. But I believe that I have a certain openness to change. I listen to arguments and uh, I evaluate them 
and uh, I either have an intellectual response to them or I myself modify my own particular stance even in some very minor way in response to what has been presented. And what Jay has presented tonight, I don't believe that he has given any reason really for me to modify anything significantly in what I have uh, presented. For example, when Jay spoke about 16.101, the verse of the Quran, uh, it actually does not say that God has replaced one verse of the Quran with another verse, not in the Arabic. It says so in an English translation uh, uh, packed with uh, parenthetical remarks from the translator that Jay seems to respect. And I wonder, is that respect for the translation based on the accuracy of the translation itself compared with the original Arabic? Or is it based on the fact that it actually feeds into Jay's rhetoric tonight? Uh, in fact, when I look at the Arabic, it, it does not give any impression that it is an ayah, a verse of the Quran, that is replacing another verse. And John Burton has dealt with this, as I said, in, a, in, a, in his book, Sources uh, of Islamic Law, which I would recommend uh, as a necessary reading to understand how the Quran should uh, be understood. As for chapter 8, verse number 39, this is often cited by Muslims who want to pursue that kind of expansionist uh, theory uh, of Muslim dominance. But the verse itself speaks about fighting until persecution is no more and is referring specifically to the fitna or the persecution which was visited upon the Muslims in the 13 lunar years that Jay spoke about when the, the Prophet Muhammad was in his hometown and when Muslim believers were being tortured, beaten and even killed by the enemy. The Quran was telling Muslims here in Surah 8 verse number 39 for example that they should fight to remove that oppression and once that oppression is, is over, then of course there is no need for a military engagement with the enemy. But the word there, fitna, which means this persecution, can have a wide variety of meanings. And Muslim commentators stretched it, as what they would do in this translation of the Quran, to mean disbelief and worshipping of other than God. The word can hardly mean that. But they have stretched it to mean that, which means now that in the translation, you, wouldn't, you shouldn't be surprised to have it say that Muslims are to fight against others until nobody else is worshipping anything other than God and everybody really has become Muslim. Well, that means that Muslims should be in a military engagement with the rest of the world for all of uh, the rest of history. And of course, this is impossible. Uh, to give the Quran a reasonable meaning, uh, it means that uh, they should fight until they remove that fitna, which in other verses of the Quran, uh, that has been referred to in the same word, uh, until that fitna, that persecution is removed and the Muslims are free to practice their religion. Jay thinks that uh, the Old Testament uh, theocracy has been fulfilled in the Messiahship of Jesus. But in fact, we have seen that the real expectation of the Messiahship of Jesus was that he should have political and military rule here on this earth. Uh, obviously, the New Testament writers were writing at a time when they were looking back and thinking that the Messiah has failed in what he was supposed to do. And the Jews were saying, well, you got a false Messiah because show us that he's sitting on a throne, then we'll believe that he is the Messiah who was promised. And they couldn't show that. All they could say is that when he comes back, he will do what he was supposed to do, which was slay the enemy, sit on the throne with the enemy being his footstool, their, their slain bodies, that is. And of course, that is really the background of the New Testament and its underlying theme, if one would be dare to look at it. Which means that the real teaching of the Bible is one about violence. But I know Christians are peaceful, especially the group that I'm proud to be part of here today, uh, organizing this conference, the Brethren of Christ, Brethren in Christ. I know that uh, you are known for your peaceful outlook, and I really respect that. But you are peaceful not by following the dictates of, of the Bible. Jay se seems to think that the modern West is constructed on Judeo-Christian principles. I would like him to define these principles and to show how they are really rooted in the Bible. But in fact, uh, what I understand is that the modern West is actually constructed in, in, uh, uh, out of modernism, which came out of the Enlightenment period, which was a response uh, to many of the creeds uh, and, and biblical teachings. Uh, so I think it is false to really make that claim. And uh, one could, in fact, on the other hand, look back at the Quran and look at the ways in which it has been uh, re misinterpreted over time, Interpret it not because we want to be politically correct in Canada, but because we have a historical curiosity to find out who precisely was Muhammad before the writers after him tried to make him out to be something else. Just as we should have a historical curiosity about Jesus. 
What were his political ambitions before Romans 13 was written, before 1 Peter was written? And we would find that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually was a man about peace. We know this because the words which are most uh, accurately credited to him are the words of the Quran. And these uh, represent a peaceful outlook when the Quran is understood in the light of its context and its own text. In conclusion then, I really want to thank Jay for engaging me tonight. I think he's been a very gracious individual, uh, despite his uh, moments of, of anger. And, <laughs> and I think that you have been a gracious audience, and I, ref I, I look forward to doing this again. Thank you so much, uh, John, for uh, hosting us in such uh, a, 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 a spirit of uh, amiableness and, and friendship. And I look forward to more such engagements, starting with uh, on our way out tonight. I hope that I'll have the chance to meet some of you personally and uh, know more of the person behind the smiling faces here. Thank you. Isn't he engaging? I love Shavir. We've had a good number of 10 years that we've known each other, and we've debated four times in the past. Uh, and it's still, one thing I love about Shabir, he does love the minutiae, and he loves to attack every point that I make. It's terrific to see how he does he, the, the discipline of his mind, and I think we need to be encouraged by that, because here's a man that takes his religion very seriously. And we're going to see many men like this. In fact, one of the things I love about Muslims, you never get a passion like you see amongst Muslims, and it embarrasses me as a Christian just how little passion we have for what we believe and how to defend it or even define it in a public context. Many, almost all the Muslims I work with don't defend it the same way Shabir would defend it. In fact, they would probably not even, they would probably debate with him on my side against him with some of the things he said tonight. But what, one thing you have to admire, and if you saw what happened tonight, is that this is something that could carries out right across the world. We do debates like this all over. We debate on university campuses in Britain. We don't do so many, do so many in this country. We're debating next Tuesday on the radio, and I'll be debating another much more impassioned and a lot more radical Muslim. And one of the things I love about debate, it does give you as an audience the opportunity to see both sides, and you have to walk away with a conclusion. Which is the religion of peace? Which is the book of peace? Now, you notice my Bible is always bigger than my Quran. I do that purposely, so people know exactly which one I, which one I consider to be the most important. These are the two books I use all the time at Speaker's Corner on university campuses when I go on the radio like I will next Tuesday. And everywhere I go, I find that I have to come back home. I've got to come back to this book. Because this is the paradigm that I love. This is the man that I love, Jesus Christ. This is the gospel that I love. Not just on peace. Almost every aspect. I've said for 25 years, show me something about Jesus that's not relevant for today. I've never heard anybody that can give me an answer to that. He is the most relevant man because of what he did and what he said. He's as relevant today as he was the day he was here 2,000 years ago, and that's my Lord Jesus Christ, and I give you him, and I give you his peace. Shabir, come on home. He's waiting. <laughs> there we go. You may remain standing if you wish. Thanks again to Shabir, to Jay, and to all of you. There is, in fact, a book table in the lobby that Shabir, Shabir and his friends have brought. I'm not clear just where the book table is. Out in the... It's over here in this room, on this wall where we're pointing. Thank you. I was not clear, and I did know that I needed clarification. Please go talk with the men there, examine the literature, talk with Shabir, and let there be peace.